kind of um, common themes to them, right? Um, we had Sunday of Zacchaeus, the son of the publican and Pharisee, the prodigal son. Uh, does anyone know what comes the, the next Sunday? What comes the next Sunday? Last judgment. Okay. Last judgment. All right, good. See, if you guys all went to church school this morning, you, you, you would know the answers. Um, the, the last judgment, um, and then and then the, the Sunday right before um, Lent is called what? It has a few names. It's called what? Forgiveness Sunday, okay? And the theme for that Sunday is the expulsion of Adam and Eve from paradise. So what you have in all of these pre-Lenten Sundays is you have this kind of theme of, of repentance um, and of humility and, you know, of of forgiveness, right? So, you know, you have Zacchaeus, who is kind of wayward, and he has to kind of humiliate himself, and, you know, to bring Christ. You have the publican and the Pharisee, the one who's haughty, but the publican who's, who's humble, and he's the one who receives forgiveness, right? So in these cases, there's repentance going on, there's forgiveness going on, and, and there's, there's humility, right? Um, obviously, in, in this case, we have the, you know, the forgiveness and the, hum and the humility of the son returning, um, but we also have kind of, all, we have the same, it's funny because if you look at all of them, we have the same characters in every story, right? We have the father in, in today's story, um, which is very much the same um, as, as Jesus in the story of Zacchaeus and in God the Father in the story of the public and the Pharisee. And then we have two different people in each story, right? We have Zacchaeus, and then, right, he receives kind of this forgiveness from Christ, and, and what do we have? We have people at the other table kind of griping and bickering, saying, he eats with sinners, he dines with these tax collectors, right? And what do we have in the publican and the Pharisee? We have the Pharisee, what, saying, thank God I'm not like this poor publican over here, right? And then, in this story, who do we have that fills that same role? The elder son, right? So we have these cases where someone who is sinful repents, and they're forgiven, and then we have someone who doesn't want to forgive them. We have that kind of in every case. And then, you know, in the Last Judgment, we have this whole idea of, of, of judgment is presented before us, and then we also have um, the expulsion of Adam and Eve from paradise, right? So again, we have this idea of sin and being um, driven away kind of far, far from God, you know, and... Um, perhaps this gives us an idea of what God's judgment is. You know, it looks to me that like God is a far more forgiving God than than people are, right? You know that saying, "It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God." And that actually comes from um, uh, comes from a sermon by um, uh, who's that famous Calvinist American um, preacher? I forget his name. I remember it later. Anyways, it comes from one of his sermons, but. Uh, it, it, actually, I think it's a more fearful thing to fall into the hands of, of your brother. Because we tend to be much harsher judges of other people than God is. So let's look at today's parable. In light of all these other Sundays. We have all of these different characters. And when you are listening to a parable, what you should be doing is imagining yourself into each character. Right? Each character is an opportunity for you to imagine yourself into that person and then, and then realize what that might have to say about you. Either who you are to become or who you are to be or where you also fall short. Right? Because the scriptures are full of stories right? of saints and sinners. Right? So we have stories of how to act and we have stories of some people's lives who who act like shipwrecks, right? Warnings for us to avoid the shoals and end up like them, right? So everyone has something, you can learn something from anyone, right? You can either learn from how not to live like them, or you can learn from their good example of how you should live. And so and this is the same case with this story today. So who are the characters we have? Serge, who are the characters? Who's one of them? Uh, the son. The son, which one? There's two of them. Okay, so there, we have the younger son, and what's his story? He's the one, what, who takes half the inheritance and, and runs away. Who else do we have? The older son, right? And who's the, who's the third main character? Father. Father, okay. So these three main characters here. So I'll let you, I'll let you pick. Who, who are we going to step, whose shoes are we going to step into today? Lorraine, who, who, who do you want? Who do you want us to step into? You get to pick what I'm going to preach on this morning. 
So which character do you want us to step into? First, first son. The first son. Okay, the younger one. All right. This particular, this particular son, I think, is something we can all we can all identify with, right? There's something universal, and I think parents have experienced this, where you have children who go astray. Right? Anyone who's been a parent maybe has had people like this or knows of brothers or sisters who have children who are like this. And maybe we have children who do this at different times in their lives. And we have this experience where children tend to betray or tend to um, distance themselves from their parents. Right? We all kind of do this maybe in our adolescent times where we don't want anything to do with mom or dad and we push ourselves away from other people. But in more extreme cases, we do have families who experience the same thing. And there are families here in this church who've experienced the same story that's in this parable. And that is of brokenness in the family, of relationships, of isolation, of people in their family who are far away and who have chosen, whether, whether it's the part of the father's fault, we don't know. Maybe he had something to do with it, right? Maybe he made some mistakes, maybe not, right? But whatever the case, this young man took what he had received from his, from his family. And we can understand this in more than just the concrete ways of inheritance, right? We can understand this in everything that we as children receive from our families, right? The, the education we receive, the values, the experiences, the character and virtue that's been built into us, all of our memories, and we take that as an inheritance and we, and we run away with it. And what happens to this son? Like, like many sons or children we've had, right, who drift away, they get isolated. And what happens when you are isolated? What happens when you find yourself drifting far away? Feel alone. What's that? Feel alone. You feel alone. And you're vulnerable. And you often develop habits of extreme self-destruction, just like this young man. And it's a warning to us and a reminder of how important community is and family is in keeping us healthy. Because when we're alone, we don't do very well. Like, for example, I, I don't know if you've heard the news, like in Rikers Island, um, the prison system of New York City, there's a lot of um, reporting going on about the abuse of solitary confinement on, on, on prisoners being too excessive, you know? And you think, oh, solitary confinement is not that bad. You don't realize how bad solitary confinement is, so you had to do it. It's extremely torturous to be by yourself. Actually, I, I mean, this is one of the practices that monks and other monastics take upon themselves, is practicing silence and retreat and being away and by yourself. And you can really go crazy. Because you start to realize that you don't like yourself as much as you think, and you can't stand being just with you. And what it exposes is a, is a, is a, a poverty of inner life that you have. That when you don't have a strong inner life, when you're by yourself, you realize that there's not, there's not much there, and, and, and you despair very easily. And so people who are in solitary confinement in these prison systems often develop severe mental health problems, and it's extremely torturous. And so th that's a little microcosm of what we do in our own lives, either when we have loved ones who have distanced themselves and isolated themselves from us, or maybe we have been that prodigal son at some point in time. Maybe with our family, our communities, our friends, whatever that God-given family has been to us, maybe we have isolated ourselves from them at certain times. People who've suffered from addiction often do this. They isolate themselves, right? So they can be alone. This theme of, of, of isolation runs through all of these pre-Lenten Sundays that we have. Adam and Eve, what? They're expelled, right? They're, they're cast out. <clears throat> and so like the son, whether we are the ones who are isolated and running away, or whether we have, or whether we have people in our lives who are isolated and running away, we have some really good imagery here to help us of how to deal with this problem. Because we should acknowledge that this is a, a real problem. That the human condition... And one of the reasons people come to church and they come to faith and they practice this is because we feel isolated and alone. We sometimes don't feel connected. The relationships that we would want to have intimacy, to be known by other people and to belong, often fall apart or don't work or don't live up to what we had hoped they would be. Right? And so what is church? What is church but a re 
reenactment of the story of the prodigal son, where we can find a place where we can belong and we can come back to, right? Or a place where we can be like the Father to receive people who come. This very much captures what it means for us, let's get concrete, for us here at Holy Apostles to be, is either to be the prodigal son or to be the person who receives the prodigal son. And so we have a story that shows us both how we come back home and both how we receive people who need a home. And if there's any ministry that the church can offer today in this world, it's being a home for people. People don't have homes. People are so disconnected from family and friends and meaningful relationships that what our local churches, what this church can offer, is a place for people to belong. And if we're coming home to church, right, even, even if we come to church all the time here, and this is our home, we still have this act to, to play out of the prodigal son, and that is, whether it's throughout our week or, or whatever, when we come to church to meet together, we have to kind of return to ourselves. It's a chance to kind of come home. And like the prodigal son, what does it say? He's eating right, but the husks of, of, of the pigs, right? He's feeding out of the feeding trough. And what does it say? He says, and then he came to himself, right? He, or in other translations, he came to his right mind. And our decision to come to church, whether it's every Sunday or other services, is often a, a chance for us to get back in our right minds. But after the busyness, the stress, after the many encounters of, of unlove and hate and other vices throughout the week, we have a place where we can come and hopefully come back in, in, into our, our, our right minds. And if there's any way in our lives where we feel that we have drifted far away, that we have sins like this prodigal son, we know that this church is a place that we can always come back to. That no matter how far we fall, no matter how low, no matter how many harlots we buy with our inheritance, we can always come back. And there's always opportunities for us to come to our senses. Brothers and sisters, that is the good news. That is why the gospel is called good news. And this story is given to us on this Sunday before Lent to remind us of what we're doing. That what Lent is, is a reenactment of the prodigal son. It's a chance for us who, in whatever shortcomings or failings or selfishness that have turned into nasty habits in our lives, Lent is an opportunity for us to all of a sudden realize that we're feeding with the pigs in our behavior, in our thoughts, in our life choices, and it's a chance to wake up and to come back. And Lent is this journey, right? It's a journey like the children of the Hebrews in the wilderness for 40 days. As they journey for 40 years, we're going to be journeying for 40 days to get home. And home is with Christ and his family that he's created. What's great about the church is that it doesn't matter what race or class or what blood connection you have with somebody, it's a home for everybody. And so no matter who comes through those doors, we have to remember that we are all prodigal children and that we have to receive people with the same unconditional open arms, with no strings, with no expectations, with no demands, we receive people just as they are. Because you know what changes people and makes them better, that makes them into the people we're meant to be? It's not a pointy finger. It's not condemnation. It's love. When someone is truly loved, they will feel incapable of doing selfish and base things. When they're truly loved, they will feel like they can't do anything else but love back. Lord Jesus Christ. Lord,